Okay, so good morning and uh, thanks for coming and it's a great honor for me to be the first one to uh, start this uh, workshop. It's a big responsibility because I have to talk about one of the tops of the workshop. Um, and I'll try to, uh, so I have something like 45 minutes, but please interrupt me if you have questions. I don't have to go all the way through and this is actually, uh, this workshop should be um, actually for discussions here. So um, one of the main topics of the work workshop is uh, surface acoustic waves. So uh, surface acoustic waves are vibrations propagating along a surface. And one of the nice things about these vibrations is that they can be relatively easy produced using uh, this kind of structures into digital transducers. And they propagate in semiconductors and other materials. And we have been interested in using these vibrations to control excitations in semiconductors. Uh, <coughs> And basically, uh, uh, they are very nice for, for controlling photons. They can also be used to control and transport electrons, holes, uh, spins. Uh, we are at the spice here. And what I would like to do today is to show you some, uh, basically review some recent results we have on the control of uh, excitons and exciton polaritons using surface acoustic waves. So excitons are mixed particles. So exciton is basically a, a uh, electron hole pair bound by the Coulomb interaction. And we are going to see that acoustic waves have very special properties that allow us to control excellence. This is the fact that you have a moving strain field. So excellence are neutral, but these moving strain fields can basically uh, confine and can also transport excitons. So this is going to be one motivation. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about external polarities as relatively complicated structures. Now, this work has been founded by different institutions here, the German Physical Society, uh, the German Israeli Foundation, and the DAAD. And I would like to start by acknowledging people who really did the experimental work here. And this is a series of postdocs and PhD students at the Paul Drude Institute. In the case of Extons, I would like just to mention here Adriana Violanti, Colin Hubert, and Sejana Lazic. Uh, so Adriana is not no longer with us. Sejana is also no longer with us. She is somewhere here, Madrid. And in the case of Polaritans, Edgar Serda and Yakov Pula. So uh, Edgar moved recently to uh, Mexico. Um, the samples I'm going to show you here from the Paul Drude Institute. So uh, there's a lot of work to do these samples. And we also have some technology for fabrication of transducers and so on and so forth. And of course, everything is done in collaborations. And I'd like to mention some of them here, in particular in the case of Exitons with the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the group of uh, Ronen Rappaport. In the case of Polaritons, we have actually very fruitful collaboration with the University of Sheffield here. Now let me go through. Uh, show you an outline of this talk. So this is the first talk about acoustic waves. So I decided to make a brief review because this is a topic that's probably not goes through all uh, the audience here. So I'm going to talk, say some words about surface acoustic waves. And then I would like to see two aspects, to talk about two aspects of exciton control. And one aspect is uh, transport of excitons. How can we use acoustic fields to transport excitons? And for that, we are going to use special kind of excitons, what we called uh, indirect excitons or dipolar excitons and show you that basically these neutral particles, they behave pretty much like electrons in acoustic fields. In the second part of the talk, um, we're going to combine excitons with photons and create polaritons. And uh, we are going to see that polaritons can be very well controlled by acoustic fields. So basically put in acoustic lattices and you're going to see how they uh, react or how they behave in acoustic lattices. And one nice thing about polaritons is that these are quantum phases, extended quantum phases, and we can create lattices of these quantum phases using acoustics. Now let me start with acoustic waves. So, uh, and let me put you, uh, uh, give you some basically motivations why actually these acoustic waves are quite interesting for us. So basically, uh, if you hit a piece of material, and this should be an animation, this is a simulation made by the group of uh, Ole Sigmund, the Technical University of Denmark, and I like it very much because if you hit the material, you can create bulk vibrations propagating towards the bulk. It creates also surface vibrations. This should be moving, but it's not moving for some reason here. So we don't have to hit the material. We can also use the piezoelectric effect. So we use this kind of interdigitated structure. So these are finger structures. And if you have a piezoelectric material, and gallium arsenide, for instance, is piezoelectric. If you apply a radio frequency field through the piezoelectric effect, we vibrate the material, and then we end up with a wave just propagating to the outside region here. And this wave can modulate structures, for instance, a quantum well. Now, typically, we will be working with these vibrations. So these are like mini earthquakes with 
a wavelength of one micrometer, so this is actually several orders of magnitude, this is smaller than the wavelengths of real earthquakes, and frequencies around one gigahertz. So why are they interesting for us? And there are several reasons for that, and I list three of them here. The first is actually that these waves create uh, spatial modulation. So you see it directly here. This spatial modulation also penetrates into the material, and the penetration depth is around is approximately equal to the wavelength, so approximately one micrometer. And this is the typical thickness of layers used in, in semiconductors. This modulation is time dependent, so it allows you to make uh, dynamic control. You can turn on and turn off. This should be moving here so that you can see it. And the, nice, the third point that we're going to explore is that uh, this is a potential, moving potential, so we can put excitations with these moving potentials and move or transport these excitations with the acoustic velocity. Now, um, if we want to use this phenomenon, and the first thing we have to do is to understand how these vibrations actually interact with the material. And the interaction mechanisms are quite simple. And this is actually a picture of the atomic position, the atomic displacements created by the acoustic wave. So we're going to be using here Rayleigh acoustic wave. And the first thing that happens is that you see that the wave deforms the material with the, the wavelength. So it changes dimensions and also changes locally the density. And changes in density or changes in symmetry leads to modulations of the band gap. So this is the deformation potential mechanism. If you change the band gaps, you change many other properties, for instance, the refractive index and, and many other properties. Now, the kind of uh, modulation profile you get from the strain is something like that. Normally, the, you have modulation of the conduction band and of the valence band uh, that resembles a type 1 modulation. So the minim you have minima and maxima at different positions. So this can change, but in most of the cases, you have something like that. And for the typical acoustic waves you are going to be using, the amplitude of the modulation is uh, on the order of a few milliv. No? The nice thing about that is that this band gap modulation allows us to uh, confine excitons. If you create excitons, basically this couple the electron hole pairs, they are going to go to the positions of minimal energy, so they are going to be stored in this position. Now, if this modulation moves, then we also expect that the excitons are going to move with the modulation. We are going to show you some examples uh, later on. Now, the condition for basically transport is that the mobility of the exton times the gradient of the potential here should be on the order of, uh, should be higher than the acoustic velocity. So the extons can actually follow the, the uh, changes in the acoustic field. And uh, in special materials like cadmium arsenide, you can actually satisfy these conditions we're going to see in a moment. Now, uh, most of, in most of the cases, this strain field is generated by piezoelectric effect. So in most of the cases, we have, in addition to the strain field, also a piezoelectric field in the material. And the piezoelectric field creates another kind of modulations. You see that it's like a wave-like modulation here. It doesn't change so much the gap, but it introduces a big modulation here. And it's a very, sure, very good tool to enclose electrons. For instance, if you put electrons here, they are going to be stored here and moved with the wave. And this is quite high. It's probably two orders of magnitude larger than the modulation created by the strain. Now, um, we are going to see many examples of the use of this piezoelectric modulation to uh, manipulate charge in semiconductors. In this talk, I'm not going to talk about that. And actually, we would like to avoid this modulation here in, for working with the excitons. And the reason for that is that this modulation basically breaks the excitons. So basically, if you put excitons in this kind of potential, so the electrons are going to be here, the holes are going to be here, and we dissociate the excitons. So we have to avoid that. We are going to see how to do that. Now, these very simple uh, mechanisms have led to uh, actually very many uh, functionalities in, in the research on acoustic waves and semiconductors. And I'm going to make a real, uh, very brief overview. And this is going to be, uh, it's by far not complete, and, uh, but basically shows that acoustic waves is becoming something that is actually uh, bringing together different communities. So at one side, we have the technology, how to go to uh, very high frequencies, and I think we're going to hear more about that. So basically, it's now possible to generate acoustic waves up to some, uh, 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 piezoelectrically generate acoustic waves up to some tens of uh, gigahertz. Uh, these, uh, basically, these high frequencies are quite interesting because we can go into the regime of quantum acoustics. I'm sure you're going to hear something about that during this workshop. That's one, uh, uh, one important fact. The second thing is that there have been many concepts to use acoustic waves to, uh, to control photons 
or photonic systems in, in semiconductors, so basically waveguides or membranes and so on and so forth, so very nice work done in this direction. Uh, acoustic waves also have been, been used very uh, uh, successfully to transport carriers and also to transport spins. So basically you can use acoustic waves to couple quantum dots and move electrons between them in a very uh, uh, controlled way. And finally, I just want to mention the work on excitons and the exciton polaritons here. And the basic idea here is to, instead of electrons, we would like to go to this kind of uh, more complicated structures. And this is going to be the topics of the next uh, uh, maybe half an hour or 15 minutes or 25 minutes. Okay, so let me start with excitons here. Basically, uh, what are excitons? As I said before, so this is an electron hole pairs basically coupled by the Coulomb interaction. So there is actually a, a bound state of an electron in the hole. And uh, so what we'd like to do is to use acoustic waves to transport uh, and to manipulate these excitons here. And uh, so basically, uh, we would like to create uh, with excitons some analog to electrons. So basically, instead of transporting just electrons, we transport the electrons in the hole together. And why should we actually do that? It's much more complicated. And the reason for that is that excitons give us a very good interface to photons. So if you do that, you can basically transport the excitons and then send them away in the form of photons. So basically, you can really explore this direct conversion between uh, excitons and photons. And this is one of the, our main motivations to do that. Now, there is a problem that appears here from the beginning, is that uh, in contrary to electrons, excitons are actually metastable particles. You generate them, but if you put, they can also recombine with the whole. And this normally takes place in a very short time. So we have to to think about that because acoustic waves are very small, very slow. So one way to get around that, and basically I think I have a sketch here showing this process, so if you have a quantum well, I put two quantum wells for reasons we're going to see in a moment, if you generate excitons, basically we illuminate, you create the excitons in the quantum well, so within something like one nanosecond, basically the recombines and light out, so we don't have anything. So we have to uh, do something about that because this time, recombination time, is typically uh, smaller than the, uh, uh, the period of the acoustic wave. Now, uh, there is a simple way to get around that, and this is to get a double quantum L system as shown here. So we two quantum Ls coupled by a thin uh, thundering barrier. And now if we excite the excitons in these quantum Ls, we can basically control using an electric field the uh, overlap between the electron and whole wave functions. If you control the overlap, you could control the recombination lifetime. And this is actually the nice thing about these indirect excitons, especially indirect excitons, or also called dipolar excitons. They are also called dipolar excitons because this also creates an electric dipole that is going to be important in some applications. And this dipole can be uh, basically the higher the field, the higher the, 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 the the better the separation of the electrons and holes. And also the electric field also controls the energy. So the energy of this exciton, indirect exciton, is normally smaller than this, the, the, the excitons in each one of the quantum wells. Now this actually is some of the properties that makes these excitons uh, very interesting. And I think that if you can summarize, this is the fact that you have a neutral particle that you can now control using uh, electric fields. So we can control uh, energy, we can control recombination lifetime, and you can control uh, the uh, dipole moment here. Uh, the electric field I'm going to show you in a moment also can control spin properties. It separates electrons and holes, and just the separation increases the spin lifetime. I'm going to show some examples in a moment. Now, there had been uh, also a lot of interest in these indirect excitons because of this dipole moment. So basically, they can, uh, the dipoles basically repel each other in a, if you have two excitons in a double layer. And um, very recently, there have been some results where these uh, repulsive interactions has been, have been, has been used to basically uh, confine single excitons. And the basic idea here is that if you put excitons in a very small trap, this is something like 500 nanometers here, then the energy of these excitons will depend on the population. So the energy for a single exciton state is going to be different to the energy with two excitons because you have the repulsion. You can actually see s different lights in the emission spectrum that corresponds to one exon, two exon, three exons, and so on and so forth. So basically, these repulsions or these interactions allow you to uh, isolate single excons. And finally, uh, excitons are bosons, and so since they are bosons, they should be able to go to a, a condensate, so they condense at low temperatures. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the second part of the talk. Okay. Now, 
we uh, have these nice uh, properties for the existence, and there is also a lot of interest in using them for electrical optical devices, and I'd like to show you some examples. So the fact that you can control the energy of the exon using gates allows you to make something like an exon transistor. And I think you can see here, if you generate exons in the central island here, we can use gates here to control the flow of exons to, to the other islands. So basically, this is the fact that it arises from, from, from the uh, electrical control of the uh, energy of the excitons. This is one example. It's also possible to transport excitons using uh, electric fields. So the idea here is that we use a gate, a resistive gate here, to create a resistive uh, a potential gradient. If you put exons in the potential gradient, the energy of the exons is going to depend on position, so they can also just slide down these potential gradients. And of course, you can actually make complicated structures. You can make actually conveyors, so basically gates that you uh, bias in uh, the appropriate way to transport excitons. And the particular example we would like to talk more about is using acoustic fields. That we really don't use electric fields, but we use acoustic fields. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, all these applications use just uh, external ensembles, and we have not ex just exploited the number of accidents. It's also possible to uh, encode and transport the spin information in excitons. And uh, I have a little bit complicated slide that try to guide you through that and how you can actually show that you can transport spins with excitons. And the basic idea here is that we generate spin polarized excitons in uh, using a focused laser beam. So this is a plot where we have in this direction, we have position, and here we have energy, and the energy allows us to separate indirect excitons that have lower energy from direct excitons. And the first thing we see is that if you generate indirect excitons at this position here, they flow away due to this repulsion and due to diffusion, and can reach quite large distance, something like 45 into 5 micro micrometers. Now, uh, the exon in this case were generated with circularly polarized light, so they are spin polarized. And this image was taken by recording the emission of uh, the, the right circular emission. So we, we actually are mapping one spin polarization. And if you look closely here, you see there are some oscillations. There's a maximum here and a second maximum here. Now we can record a similar image uh, with left circular polarization. And we also see some oscillations, but they are out of phase. So basically, where you have a maximum, you have a minimum here. You have a maximum, you have a minimum here. And if we combine these two information, pieces of information, to make the spin polarization, we get this kind of oscillatory behavior here. And so what we have here is basically that we have spins that, uh, that are generated this position. They are moving away. And while moving away, they are actually precessing. So basically, the spins go in this direction are precessing. So we don't have external magnetic fields here, and the precession here is basically a precession in the spin opt field. So we are going to hear more about that, I hope, in the next talks about uh, the role of the spin opt coupling in the spin, uh, in spin polarization, in spin control. But the point I would like to address here is that this precession uh, rate here, basically the, this precession length, can be electrically controlled and can be electrically controlled by the same electric field that generates the excitons. And I will actually show you one example of that. And this is actually plots of the spin polarization as a function of the electric <coughs> field. And you see that this period, the precession period, reduces as we increase the magnitude of the field here. And basically what we're doing here is basically change the, the amplitude of this field here. And we can actually just plot this precession period as a function of field, and we see that we can electrically control the precession frequency. And this is a very nice thing because we can, the same field that's gen used to generate the excitons can also control the, uh, the dynamics of the excitons spins here. I'm not going to go into the details, we understand quite well where this comes from, but the nice point about this indirect exciton is that we can electrically control their spin behavior. So these excitons have very nice properties, and so what we would like to do now is that instead of just transporting the electrons in this, the excitons in this case by diffusion and drift, we'd like to use acoustic fields. So how we do that, then we just uh, build some, this kind of structures here. So basically, we have a double quantum wave structures. We have to control the, 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 the growth so that we have a thin barrier in between for the tunneling. We generate acoustic waves. So we'd like to have non-piezoelectric acoustic waves, and there is a trick to do it, is just to put the transducers on a piezoelectric material. So here we have a piezoelectric field that we need to generate the, the acoustic wave. 
And in this region, we don't have a piezoelectric field, but we have to put some gates also in order to create this uh, field for the excellence. So this is very simple, so it takes time to do it because we normally make many mistakes in the design, but we finally managed to do this. And uh, the way to probe it is by optically. So we generate excellence with the light beam and look at their photoluminescence. And the nice thing is that we can basically map, basically di directly map the transport of excellence. And this here shows two examples and basically illustrates the effect of the acoustic wave. So this side here, we just uh, make a picture, a photoluminescence picture, without acoustic waves. You see, you generate the excellence here, and we look at the distribution. So most of the excellence just stay around the generation point. In the second one, we turn on the acoustic waves, and you see that you have some luminescence here, but we get a lot of luminescence at the end here. So what happens here is that we acoustic waves transport this excellence, and the excellence go to the end of the semi-transparent layer here. This is where you apply the bias, and they cannot go further because if you try to go further, the recombination lifetime reduces, and they are forced to recombine here. And we can actually uh, uh, just look at the spectroscopy, and we can actually get that uh, uh, the luminescence comes really from the indirect excellence. Yes. Um, well, the trick here, I think I went too quickly, is that uh, we are propagating acoustic waves along the 100 direction of gallium arsenide. And this direction in gallium arsenide, if you apply the strain, you don't create an electric field. Okay? But you can still generate the wave because you put the transducers on a piezoelectric layer. Okay? So this is basically the same thing you do with silicon. Okay? But this is very important, and I, I think if I have time, I'm going to show you some examples. It's really very important to avoid the piezoelectric potential. Okay, we can also get here information about the, I think I'd like to stress here the distance here. So we have here something like half a millimeter and basically this transport distance is just uh, basically limited by the, the length of our channel here. And we can also get information about the transport uh, efficiency if you count the number of pixels you have at the beginning of the transport and at the end, and you get a transport efficiency of approximately 50%. So we lose some excitons, but actually the distances are quite large, so it's not that inefficient. Now, these measurements have been done using, uh, uh, basically there is no time uh, resolution in these measurements, but what we can do is uh, basically create excitons using a, a pulsed laser, Pulse, so basically you create a cloud of excitons, and we can follow this cloud as it moves along the transport path, and optically it's easy to do. And I'll show you an example, yeah. No example here, and so if you are very close to the generation point, we have to wait a very short time, and you have this pulse that comes, the, the excitons coming out. If you go farther away, there is a longer delay, and the longer you go, the, the larger the delay, and this delay is just the <coughs> propagation time. Now, this kind of pulse is actually quite, quite uh, uh, unusual because you see the, 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 the onset corresponds to the propagation time, but then you have a tail here, and meanwhile we understand the origin of this tail, and this tail comes from trapping, and this is something that's unavoidable if you uh, have defects, so some of the excellence get trapped, and they are released, but they are released, when they release, they come late, and this makes this kind of tails. It turns out that we can actually explain very nicely this uh, for the shape of this profile by just taking into account an exponential distribution of uh, uh, trapping times here, and you see that the dash lines are basically fits to the uh, using a very simple model. So uh, I brought this point here to show that uh, here there comes a point where the material properties become very important. It would be very nice to improve the, uh, 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 the material so that you reduce the number of traps and so on and so forth. But is the, is the functional form different from exponential? Um, the decay? The de we actually have uh, basically a convolution between an exponential and a Gaussian. That's the form of the shape of the profile potential. Okay, so, it's, uh, so if you do the convolution, it's going to be a mixture. It's difficult to say because it's a mixture. Okay. Okay? It's a phenomenological model, but I think that the point is that you have a single uh, release time for most of the traps. And we also made some studies of the trap distribution by changing the, the amplitude of the potential. Okay. Now, um, we can also use uh, these special properties of, the, uh, of this 
uh, electrically controlled distance to control the transport. And I will just show you two examples. One example is how can we uh, basically control the, 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 the flow of excitons using an acoustic transducer. So, tra transistor. So basically, instead of having a continuous uh, metal layer here, we interrupt this metal layer with a thin gate, something like one micro wide gate. And I show you what happens if you have the gate open. So gate open means that the gate potential is equal to the potential of the adjacent region. So basically, the excitons just go through. Now we can close the gate. We can put another potential and create a barrier so the exon gets stopped. And the nice thing about that is that even if you have an acoustic field, we can use these gates to uh, confine the excitons. It provides you a new degree of, of uh, functionality. And finally, uh, another example is that we can use acoustic fields to control the exon flow. And this is an example of the way we do it. So basically, if you have a transistor here, we close the excitons and you open it, the excitons are going to move here. If we turn off this beam, they're going to go all the way through. If you turn on this beam, you see you, cre you can actually shift it, move the direction of, of uh, the excitons here. And the reason for that, I think I have to, is the fact that if the dots you see here, these small dot potentials that are created by interference, they don't move, they move in the oblique direction. So the exciton comes from this channel here, just bend around. And I'm going to, you can also see these potentials, and this is actually one example. So if you move outside, you see a single acoustic wave. If you go to the interference region, you see this kind of um, uh, egg box potential. This is in the interference region, and this is actually moving, but moving the oblique direction. So that it can actually pick up excess from here and turn around. And this is a nice thing that we can directly image using photoluminescence. So this is a photoluminescence image uh, when the two beams are on, so you see that the beam turns around, and the efficiency is actually quite large. So, so we have very few exons coming over mm -hmm. here. If you go in one direction, you can also go to the other direction. You can actually turn around in the other direction. So we can use this kind of process to, co to interconnect different gates, and you can do it in a, basically in a reversible way. So this shows some of the examples uh, of functionalities and things you can do by combining exons with surface acoustic waves. No, you can actually, uh, what we are going to, and I think that would be very nice to do acoustic spin transport using this kind of systems here. We have very uh, preliminary results on that. It turns out to be much more difficult than we thought. We see that a slightly enhancement in the transport efficiency, but I think we have to work a lot on that. And one of the points is that the confinement of the exons in this acoustics potential is very small. So there's actually a kind of ongoing research. And what would be also very nice to do would be to go to the few external, single external regime. So we really have to make very small traps for externs and then to transport them. And I think I have, that's basically what one of the, our main goals is to transport externs with very few externs and also to control this transport using interactions. For instance, if you put externs here, it should ask actually proposals to use this kind of gates for controlling the external flux here. Now, one of the main charge, charges here is that this interaction of excitons is actually a dipolar interaction. Dipolar interactions actually go over long distance, but in fact, we have to put the excitons very close together to, uh, to see changes in the potential, and this is actually a big challenge for that. And this is actually what led us with one motivation to go to the second type of systems that we're going to talk in a moment, that uh, exciton polaritons. So I'm going to switch now to <coughs> exciton polaritons. And uh, so this is a... Again, an excitonic system. Uh, what happens in the exciton polarities, I think I have a diagram here, yeah, yeah, is that now we have excitons. We're just using now conventional excitons, uh, what we call direct excitons. And we are putting these excitons in a micro cavity. So basically, we have a cavity with quantum wells. And on the bottom, the top, we put Bragg mirrors. And these Bragg mirrors, what they do is that if we excite excitons, the excitons are going to emit. But these mirrors are going to reflect the photons back. And these things can happen a thousand of times. So we end up basically inducing a strong coupling between the excitons and the cavity photons. And this is strong coupling, what this leads to a new particle, and this particle is the polariton. Uh, you are probably more familiar to a description of the polariton in terms of the dispersion. If you look at the dispersion of the exciton and the photon in the plane of the cavity, so these are the dashed lines here, you're going to see that the Photons have a parabolic dispersion in the cavity. The excitons have also parabolic dispersion, but with a very large mass here. Now, if the two particles couple, we create two new particles, the lower polariton and the upper polariton. No? 
And this is we're going to be uh, interested here in this lower polarity here. So why is this lower polariton so interesting? And the main reason for that is that polaritons are basically half exciton, half light, and so they are very light. And in fact, the mass of polaritons is orders of magnitude, four to five orders of magnitude lower than electron mass, and basically four orders of magnitude lower than the exciton mass. So it means that the Broglie wavelength, the size of the polariton wave function, is very large. It's actually much larger than the acoustic wavelength. And that's, uh, so this is several micrometers. And this is actually what makes this polariton very interesting for us. So we can actually, instead of having these particles, the exciton with a very uh, small uh, extension, we go to something that actually has extensions of same tens of micrometers. And since the extension is actually larger than the acoustic potential, we can coherent modulate these structures, especially modulate these structures. Now, polaritons are also bosons. And uh, it turns out that since the, uh, the Broglie wave length is very large, it's also easy to reach the condensation regime. So basically, make these particles which can feel each other by increasing the density here. And you're going to see that this can actually uh, in increase the temporal coherence of polaritons. Just, just to get a number here, so, so what is the lifetime of these? Uh okay, so there are two lifetimes we have to care about. The first one is the photon lifetime, the cavity, and this is something like a few picoseconds, 10, 10 picoseconds, it's very short. And then there's the coherence lifetime. You create a polariton, if you create a polariton condensate, uh, you can, um, um, this, this, the, um, the coherence is actually long, much longer than the photon coherence. The, the photon, uh, uh, the, the photo emission time in the microcavity is on the order of 200 picoseconds in micro microcavities. But people have actually reached over 500 picoseconds and tried to go to one on a second. Depends on how, how good your Bragg mirrors are. Okay, so this is actually polarities allow us to make quantum phases that are actually <coughs> of very large extension. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this quantum phase is that we, uh, it allows us to do a completely different way of uh, uh, interaction. So we start with something that's very big. We put this in a modulated potential, as shown here, and we can actually basically fragment this, this basically uh, coherent state into many states here. And now if you have a, a tunable potential, you can create the basically amplitude of this potential, control this tunneling between the sides here. And this is something that's quite interesting for, for instance, quantum simulations and other approaches. Now, there are a few systems where people have realized these kind of things, and one of them is called atom, called atom condensates in optical lattices. The lattice, in this case, is made by the interference of, of uh, optical beams. And what we're exploring is basically to do something similar with exciton polaritons. Mm -hmm. But then we need a potential, and this potential can be provided by the acoustic waves, so based by acoustic lattices. Now, um, so we have, that's actually our main goal, and uh, so that's why we're working on that. So the basic idea is very simple here. We have a microcavity with quantum wells inside, we put transducers to generate acoustic waves, and we'd like to modulate the properties of the polarities in the microcavities. Now, a polarity is made of a photon plus an exciton, so we have to care about this modulation, so we already talked about exciton modulation. Excitons are modulated by uh, deformation potential, so the modulation of the band gap. That's the same thing here. We can also, uh, also modulate the photons, and the modulation of the photons comes from two mechanisms, and one of them, oops, sorry, let me go back here. Well, one is the change in the refractive index of the microcavity. This is the acoustic optic effect. And the second one is the change in the thickness. So you change the thickness of the cavity, and you're also modulating the, photo, the photo energies. And the, the challenge here is to combine these two modulations in a constructive way. So basically to have them in phase so that we can inc increase the total modulation. And so you have to design the cavities according to that. And some, uh, this is one of the designs we have here. We have the acoustic waves. This is the zinc oxide. And you see this is a simulation of the propagation of the wave. And I'm showing you here this because it's not actually obvious that acoustic waves can propagate in this kind of structures. And at the beginning of these studies, what was happening is that the acoustic waves were actually just plunging down here. This is because of the composition here. So we had to engineer these materials to get acoustic wave propagation. But finally, you can get this kind of uh, profiles here. This is the cavity. That's the reason we are interested in. And you see that we have, since it's actually quite far below, you would like to keep this region large to have a good mirror. There's some compromise between the wavelength of the acoustic wave and the thickness of this mirror here. 
but uh, finally we get something that uh, is reasonable. And basically the ticket of this zero also uh, controls the coherence time. Now, uh, one special point about the modulation bipolarities is that it's periodic. So we, we have a, a, a long-range coherence and we have a periodic modulation. So if we start with the lower polariton branch, this is actually parabolic, it's like the dispersion of electrons in a crystal. And now we apply the modulation, so what we expect to see is basically the formation of folded branches in, within a mini Brillouin zone determined by the periodicity here. And the nice thing is that in the acoustic potential is that these uh, folded branches, the, the dispersion and also these gaps are controlled by the acoustic amplitude. So we have a tunable potential for polarities here. Now, how can you we probe this, uh, this uh, 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 dispersion here? And the, the idea is very simple. We excite polaritons here and we measure their energy and also their momentum when they go out of the cavity. And this can be done by simply by measuring the, the angular distribution of polaritons here. And this is one example. So basically, a, a microcavity without acoustic waves, so it's a parabolic dispersion. You can directly get the mass of the polaritons from that. Now we put the acoustic wave, and you see the formation of this bunch structure. So this is a, a small amplitude. You see the, the different uh, levels here. So this is actually a, a nest-like level, it's a p-like, and d-like, and so on and so forth. If we increase the amplitude, you also increase the number of branches you can see. Now, this is actually for non-piezoelectric acoustic waves. And come back to the question of Euphred. We actually, when we start doing that, we also made experiments with piezoelectric acoustic waves. So basically, we just make transducers in another direction. This is a piezoelectric direction here. And in that case, uh, that's what we get. So basically, what happens here is that the piezoelectric potential just breaks the accidents. And we actually end up with something that's a blurred structure. So maintaining the exciton coherence is actually a very important point. And it has to do with the fact that the excitons in Gardner's night have a very small binding energy, some, a few milli electron volts. And so it's, they are very sensitive to electric fields. Now, um, these uh, uh, experiments were done in a, basically using a single acoustic wave. So basically, uh, we can also make complica more complicated structures, just combining two acoustic beams. Or the extra effort here is to make two transducers uh, at right angles here. The dispersion is likely more complicated because it's now two-dimensional one. But basically, the dispersion looks like if you make a cross-section of the dispersion, you actually looks pretty much like the last one. So basically, we have the different branches here uh, with separation governed by the uh, strain field. So basically, separation is proportional to the square root of the acoustic power. So the square root of the acoustic power gives you the uh, um, the amplitude of the acoustic field. So this is very nice, works very nice as one expects here. And this experiment is in the regime where we have a few polaritons, not many few polaritons, so you're just folding how these polaritons just fall down here. So um, the fact that you have this bunch structure means that we have a very long spatial coherence, much longer than the acoustic wavelength. So basically to form a bunch structure, you have to have interference phenomena over many periods here. And that's actually what we have. But the coherence time is very short. You see, you have a wide difference, uh, very large difference energy. Now, it turns out that we can go to another regime. We can create, uh, basically, a, a condensation of particles in the lattice. And the way we do is, basically, we increase the, uh, up the number of photons that, that we are pumping here. And finally, we induce an uh, optical paramagnetic oscillator here. So basically, two of these pump polaritons they interact with each other and generate a signal polariton that's directly on the bottom of the band and an idle polariton. And, then, and so if the concentration of um, polaritons here increases, then you have a stimulated scattering. And this is actually the regime where, where you create this kind of optical paramagnetic condensate. So uh, if you go to this regime, the main difference is that the whole dispersion just collapses into a single state. And this single state now corresponds to the lower branch of the, the lower uh, dispersion branch here. And you see that in this case, the polaritons are basically confined in the top, in the bottom of the potential here. So we don't have K conservation along this di direction. That's why you have a white trace. So you are fooling the, the lower um, <coughs> branch of the dispersion. So we can actually create uh, polariton condensates in this uh, kind of potential. So we can go from an extended state uh, that if you, you can actually change also the potential. I'm going to show you this in a moment. Now, so here we have. Uh, again, a system where we have it's still uh, uh, coherence, but it's coherence in a, in a smaller regime, so within the dots, but we have a long temporal coherence. So long means here some hundreds of picoseconds. 
Now, um, we can go ahead and try to get more uh, uh, image in these polaritons, and I just want to show you a picture that uh, how we can actually measure that is a kind of stroboscopic measurements here. So what we do, we synchronize our camera with the acoustic fields, and we make slats, snapshots of the, uh, of the emission for different times here, and you see that the condensate, it's a moving condensate because we have the interference of two acoustic waves, moving acoustic waves. And uh, basically, if we look in more in details here, uh, the potential is actually very uniform, but we have some fluctuations in intensities here. And this is basically due to the size of the laser spot. So this dimension here is something like maybe 80 micrometers. And it's difficult to get uh, enough intensities to, 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 con to make a condensate much larger than that. Uh, I think one important point here is regards the coherence. So we are transporting potential here, but we are really not transporting coherence. And the reason for that is that the coherence type of the condensate, something like 150 picoseconds in this case, is much smaller than the acoustic period. So there are two ways to get around that. One is to increase the coherence time of the condensate, so we have to probably to put more mirrors, uh, or uh, decrease the period of the acoustic waves. And it turns out that the two things are more or less contradictory. It's very difficult to do, because if you want to, to increase, the, increase the coherence time, you have to make uh, the mirrors wider. If you want to increase, but if you do that, then the acoustic wave is not going to penetrate. So there's some compromise, and we have to find a way to get a lot around this dilemma. Okay. Now, um, I'm coming to how much time we have? Uh, uh, you have, uh, let's see, you have uh, 10 more minutes until 45 minutes. So. 10 more minutes between 45, okay. Yeah, so 10 more minutes is fine. Okay. So, um, quick one, so the saw in the middle and then have to break the glass. Well, I've, this is one of the possible solutions, to couple the saw directly to the cavity, and this would be the ideal way to go. I fully agree with you. Uh, okay, so basically we have this nice uh, uh, condensates. We can also see, uh, look at the, uh, I think I have to make a change here. Okay, so we can also look at the properties of these dots here and, oh yeah, okay, so basically the way to do is actually to look at the line of these dots here, and we are looking. So the one interesting question is how does the energy of these dots actually vary with position and with the amplitude of the acoustic wave? So what we are going to do here is to image uh, the dots uh, using a spectrometer. So we're going to have information about the dots, the position of the dots in this direction, and we're going to have spectral information along this direction. And this is the situation where we have an extended, uh, basically, condensate without acoustic waves, and we are going to turn on the acoustic field. <coughs> and if you turn on the acoustic field, Okay, you see that progressive formation of the dots, and if you look carefully at the beginning, the dots are flat, and then with increasing acoustic fields, you see you begin to see some kind of bowing here. Okay, and this is due to the fact that this is a very simple explanation for that: is that what we are measuring here is basically the, the line of dots, and we have a distribution of uh, energies uh, 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 with position because of the finite size of the laser beam here. So if we have dots, and these dots have in a, in a strong potential, so we are confined, if you, the potential is small, the polaritons can basically just redistribute themselves here. If the potential, acoustic potential is large, what's going to happen is that we are going to put different number of polaritons within each one of the dots. And this different number of polaritons is actually what gives the bow in here. No? So this is actually a very interesting point that Basically, the potential, although the potential is uniform, we have different energies for the different polar, polar, uh, polariton dots here, and this energy difference arises from nonlinearities. So this is actually a very interesting example where the energy is not determined by fluctuations, but essentially by nonlinearities. Now, um, we see here a transition where the, the, the polaritons are basically flat to the position where the polaritons have different energies, and this is related to the basically spatial extension of the polaritons, and this is something we can also measure, and we do this using interferometry. So the basic idea here is that we would like to measure spatial coherence, so we have a, 
a cloud of polaritons. We can actually get the luminescence from that. And we like to interfere. Uh, um, basically, you see the phase relation between a point on the, on the image here and a point of the image somewhere else. So the way to do it is basically to interfere this image, just to overlap this image with basically a reverse of this image. So we have a mirror that just uh, reverses the image, and we add them together, and we get this interference pattern. And this is the contrast of the interference pattern. If you have an extended condensate, you have actually a, a wrong, wrong range coherence, and here's something like 20, 25 micrometers here. And also, we have actually a coherent state without acoustic waves. And now, we put the acoustic waves, and what we see, this is a little bit different. We are going to put one acoustic wave is traveling upwards, and this, uh, the polaritons are going to be enclosed in the minimum of the potential. If you look at the reverse image, the reverse image is actually going downwards here. Okay, so there's a position where the two images are on top of each other, and this gives you the central lobe, and there is a position where you shift one upwards and the other one downwards, and uh, you get uh, again interference, and this is the second lobe here. So you see some lobes here, and this is the interference between the central one and the side one. So basically, you can actually, using this method, to uh, see how uh, one of the uh, Con confined condensates interacts with the other one. And you see that at, if you have a slow acoustic, small acoustic power, there is sufficient tunneling between these states, so we, we have more or less well-defined uh, second lobes here. Now, if you increase the power, the intensity of this lobe reduces, and if you go to even higher powers, basically you just get to the central lobe because you basically, uh, you basically cut these interactions here. Now, this shows an example that we can, I think the main message here is that we can control the interaction between neighboring sites uh, in uh, just changing the, the amplitude of the acoustic waves. Now, one problem that's not shown here is that uh, we would like to do it in a very short time, uh, but this is a really, really difficult to do with acoustic waves because the acoustic waves, uh, if you want to change the amplitude, you have to take care of the bandwidth of the transducers, but this is another point. Now, uh, <coughs> I would like to uh, stop here and give my, okay, sorry. We can actually uh, basically quantify this, this findings here, and this is the coherence length along the propagation direction of the wave. So you can see that you can change it by from something like 25 micrometers down to something like half of the acoustic wavelength, so five micrometers or so. Uh, there is also a change in the coherence along the hex directions, but basically I think the main message here is that you can <coughs> tune the spatial coherence, you can tune the size of these uh, quantum states. Now, let me come to my conclusions, and uh, I thought I have addressed two topics here. One is the control and manipulation of excitons in uh, indirect excitons, where you can store some particles that we can store, you can transport, you can imprint spin information. And the other one is our polaritons, and the main properties of the polaritons are they are short-living, but they have controlled spatial coherence. You can make them large, we can make them small. And there are lots of things that we would like to do now, and some of them I already mentioned. The first one is actually uh, having single indirect excitons, or few indirect excitons, and transporting them. Uh, the second one is the polite and condensate. It will be very nice to explore uh, many of the features that have been addressed by atomic lattices. And I think also a very exciting area is uh, to mix the two systems. Uh, can you find ways of actually combining polaritons and uh, uh, indirect excitons? And the basic idea here, and there are some proposals in the literature, is that uh, polaritons have st very strong coupling to photons, uh, controllable coherence. Excitons, on the other hand, are long lifetime and uh, long uh, transport ranges. Now, if you can change one of the other, we can actually profit from both properties here. And um, there are some concepts to do that. And essentially, what we'd like to do is to put excitons, indirect excitons, in uh, microcavity here. So basically, the direct excitons, the normal excitons, interact with the phonons. They also interact with the indirect excitons. So we have this kind of scheme here, and this is a proposal by a group in, in Cambridge here, and they actually have shown that you can create this kind of systems here. And now if you have, the second important point is that indirect excitons have these very special properties that you can change the energy. So if you start in, under a condition where the indirect excitons energy is very large, we create a normal polariton. So this is one side of the, of the coupling here. Now we can actually bring down the indirect exton below the 
volatile energy. And so you should transfer these polarities to the, to the indirect external states here. And uh, sorry, this is actually what I want to show. So you bring this in a very fast way down here. So you transport, transform these polarities to indirect excitants. And actually, uh, there are some theoretical studies showing that this is actually possible to do in a time scale of some uh, hundreds of picoseconds here. So we can actually make this transition between in polaritons on this side and indirect exons at the other side. So this is actually a very exciting area, but I think we're going to see more about that in the future. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. So thank you, Paulo. There is plenty of time for questions. Okay. So on the indirect excitons, uh, uh, you have to optimize the distance between the wells somehow. Yeah. And, and so, so, so there must be an optimization there, yeah. right? So to, to create them, you want a, a fast tunneling? Yes. But to have them long live, you, you need a, a, um, a, a slow tunneling. Exactly. So you, you would like to, to have a fast tunnel. Normally, um, the way this is done is that uh, electrons have a low mass, so they can tunnel much faster than, than holes. So basically, you create a low tunneling barrier for electrons. This tunneling time must be much shorter than the recombination time. Okay? And typically, we use barriers of something like 4 nanometers. And we, you, know, you have the, the order, actually, two we have is the electric field because you can actually uh, apply the electric field and, 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 and also uh, control the lifetime of the direct existence. Of the indirect existence? Uh, in principle, you, you can get lifetimes to, to, to the microsecond or, or even tens of microsecond regimes. It depends on, 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 um, um, on the bias you apply. The problem is that if you apply a very high bias, you start to basically emit the excitons out of the quantum wells. Okay, so there is a kind of compromise. If you apply the bias, the lifetime increases. And for us, for spectroscopy, it's difficult because you don't see the excitons anymore. But then you start to see currents flow into the device. And this means that the excitons are actually, or the, the, the electrons and holes are actually being emitted from the quantum wells. So this is, I think that's the main limitation for, for the... Uh, if you low bias, no, low bias is basically the overlap of the wave functions. You can actually control the overlap, and that's actually why well, it works very nice. I don't have a picture here, but you can basically see the change in energy that shows you that you are forming the indirect system. So I, I have a very naive question. Uh, the surface acoustic waves are like water waves. They yeah. Yeah, it transfers. Um, but when you uh, describe the piezoelectric, Wait, to generate them, you, 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 you said it shakes like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's yeah. Um, the, the problem is that actually the piezoelectricity is, is a specific feature of crystals and they, they need a special symmetry for that. So, if you apply an electric field, uh, in, in the, let's say you have the, the plane here, you have two electrodes, I can put it like that. Mm -hmm. So, if you pu put in Gallimard's night, if you put, uh, if this is the 110 direction, these are the two electrodes, if you put this electric field in this direction here, so what you, you generate is basically a, a, a shear stress like that, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. So okay. So you turn right here, and that, that's a little bit difficult to represent. So basically, the the field along between the fingers here creates you a a, 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 shear. a shear component uh, uh, of the strain. Okay. Okay. Yeah, for me, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Uh, more questions? I think there's a little bit of a basic question, but uh, for me, uh, simply, uh, like a simple view of the piezoelectric here, basically separate uh, all of the electrons to do the two, two spatially separated uh, quantum yeah. worlds, yeah. and therefore should actually have to use for the Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, there is not, not, nothing wrong about that. Um, uh, I think I have to go very far away to go back here. But, uh, um, if you want to make optical experiments, I mean, that, you're completely right. If you put a piezoelectric potential, so you have the electrons and the holes, and you can separate them by micrometers. And so the lifetime is very large, and that's very good. 
Um, and this is, is a process that has been used in lots of studies. Uh, the problem is that if you, at, at the end of the story you have the excitons, you want to recombine them and send them to photons. And this is difficult if you are spatially separated. Okay? And so um, we spend a lot of time, so you, if, if you want to combine them in an efficient way, you have to bring them to traps or something like that. And this is the problem of using separated electrons and holes in, in, in the first approximation. Okay? So basically, uh, we started doing lots of studies of these electron hole transporters separated, but we found a lot of problems to get efficient recombination afterwards. That's the point number one. And the second one is that if you do that, you basically, basically you, 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 you lose the, 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 the interaction between the two particles here, the electrons and holes. So if you think about uh, a coherent transfer, you cannot coherent transfer the information that you have in a photon to uh, a pair of electrons and holes that are separated, but you can do it if they maintain the external coherence. Okay. So if there are no further questions, let's thank Paula again. Thank you.